I was reading Dan Brown's novel, Origin, this summer. In the book, the two questions raised that the novel's characters try and grapple with are, where do we come from? And where are we going? The question of where we come from is answered in the book by the usual scientific descriptions of evolution. But using evolution as a starting point, it poses an answer also to where are we going. I'm not going to spoil the ending for those who have not read the book, but it was both a glorification of emerging technologies and a cautionary tale about those same technologies. For those who read the book, perhaps you interpreted it differently, and we can talk about that another time. But the book made me think about the ways that we inevitably, as thinking beings, imagine our future. So I spent some time reading about the different ways that different people are thinking about the future. Some of them are fascinating, some are scary, and some are both. One of the more benign futurist visions that's already becoming a reality are smart houses. These houses say they provide safety and security. They have cameras on every side, and they contain a small you know, bunch of smart devices, a refrigerator that monitors what groceries are needed and orders them for us. I'm not sure I trust my refrigerator to do my shopping for me, although it might cut down on impulse buys. But there are other futurist scenarios that go further. The scientist Ray Kurzweil imagines that by 2029, the singularity will be reached. That is the time when computers and machines become smarter than humans. Various cautionary sci-fi novels have explored this possibility, and none of their scenarios have turned out particularly well. But Kurzweil believes that that's because their scenarios are fiction. He believes that the human brain will eventually be able to feed into these intelligent machines, thereby creating a transhuman hybrid of machine and human, able to transcend anything that the human brain could accomplish on its own. Jeff Bezos, the founder and CEO of Amazon, wants to use his $125 billion fortune to create an additional private space program and figure out how to get humans into space. He imagines that eventually most humans will live in space. Space, he says, has room for trillions of humans, so we should take advantage. He literally said in an interview with Business Insider, the only way that I can see to deploy this much financial resource is converting my Amazon winnings into space travel. It is never quite clear in the article where in space humans are going to be living. There are also now a few companies exploring the mining of asteroids. Apparently, from the pieces of meteors and asteroids that have fallen to Earth, we have discovered that there are metals on these asteroids and that these near Earth and that these asteroids with near Earth orbits, we can extract gold and platinum, maybe other things. We just need to figure out the asteroids that have the best odds of containing these precious metals. I listened to a podcast called Team Human. The host, Douglas Rushkoff, explores the relationship between humans and emerging technologies. He's always asking the question, however, how is technology being used to create a better world for all? In other words, how do we act and use technology that enables us not just necessarily to be more plugged in, but to be more fully human? He was asked recently to speak at a conference about the future of technology. Expecting to speak before an audience in a lecture hall, he was surprised to find himself in a room with five billionaire hedge fund managers. 
After asking him some mundane questions, they finally got to the question they were most interested in and about which they spoke in their remaining time together. And their question was, how do I maintain authority over my security force after the event? In other words, this event meant irreversible catastrophic climate change, perhaps social unrest, nuclear war, or such other event that would leave them vulnerable, particularly if their money was no longer worth anything. Among their suggestions were shock collars in return for survival and things of that nature. Their fear is not necessarily unfounded. Guy McPherson, retired climate scientist, believes that humans maybe have 10 years left before the planet becomes uninhabitable and humans become the victims of the sixth great extinction. All right, even if it takes a lot longer for humans to become extinct, my first thought when I read stuff like these techno visions of the future is, wow, the wrong people have the money. <laughs> and my second thought is fleetingly, what if their technovisions have some merit? Maybe asteroid mining is a good idea. Maybe people will enjoy traveling to Mars or wherever else Jeff Bezos thinks up to send them. Maybe integrating our brains with some AI-capable machines, thus creating a form of super more than human, is a good idea. So I'm always second guessing my utter revulsion at the thought of these ideas. I ask myself, am I just a curmudgeon or do I really have ethical and moral objections to these and other emerging technologies? I think my biggest objection to the aforementioned technologies is that they're escape technologies. They enable a person in some way, shape, or form to transcend the human condition. Even what might be considered a somewhat benign smart house is in a way a very individual escape fortress. A person can escape into an automatically climate controlled space which is carefully monitored by outdoor security cameras and security systems that can enable them to feel safe. Because of all the smart houses I browsed on the internet, security systems are their baseline feature. There is a fear of the unknown other who might transgress their secured space. Even something as simple as a smart refrigerator enables a person to avoid having to have the experience of picking out ripe fruit or of even knowing how. They are visions that are born of fear. Fear of death in the case of Ray Kurzweil, who seems afraid of the fact that in the future he, like everyone else, may no longer exist in a material way. In the case of Jeff Bezos, escaping the damage we have wrought on the planet by simply moving someplace else, without wondering how perhaps, maybe with $123 billion, there might be a way to help imagine a solution to environmental degradation instead of escaping it or exporting it to other planets. As for asteroid mining, it is simply a way for people to continue an extractive mindset that has been destructive of this planet and it will continue to be destructive elsewhere. My mind reels at these visions. But in our reading this morning by Stephen Schick, we heard about another kind of vision, the vision of Wangari Matai to plant trees. In the implementation of her vision, thousands of women working in community planted millions of trees. You see, what's missing in those aforementioned visions was what was present in Wangari Matai's, and what was present was human relationship, was community. In order to create a different kind of future, we must envision it before we can live into it. The aforementioned visions are possible because people are currently working toward these visions. But there are other ways to envision the future. Jennifer Nordstrom, in the book Justice on Earth, 
imagines another vision. She writes, I hold a vision of beloved community beyond the horizon of my own knowing. In this community of human and non-human beings, we live with each other and the earth. We work together to nourish and sustain the earth. We eat well, but we do not take more than we need from each other or the earth. We have diverse, flourishing cultures that cooperate with, respect, and learn from one another without prejudice or hierarchy. We celebrate every day and we appreciate the joys of living. We use our minds to the benefit of life, not death. We live in tune with the rhythms of our own hearts. Her vision is decidedly vague, but it describes an ethic we can live into. I live in an intentional community, and I have security around my house. It's not in the form of cameras. It's in the form of people who know and love me. I am never afraid in my own house, even without carefully programmed, climate-controlled interior. In the summer, my windows and even sometimes my doors are deliberately left open. People walk into my house without knocking, sometimes inconveniently, and I like it that way. And I am at the point in my life that if someone would happen to come in and take something, I think I might be relieved. <laughs> <laughs> I don't own very many things that I think would be that particularly valuable to anyone else, even if they could find them in the chaos that is my house. Security for the future is not found in shock collars and the control of a security force, but rather in the warmth of community. In the past week, I experienced a loss. My friend Mark died unexpectedly last weekend. Yesterday was his memorial service. The church in which the memorial service was held, deliberately chosen for its large worship space, was packed. As I looked around the sanctuary, I saw a vast range of people from a broad range of communities in which Mark was involved. As he was eulogized, I realized the many ways his kindness and friendship was felt by so many people. He was not a brain integrated into a smart machine, but a life integrated into the networks of community of which he was part. And because of that, I believe he will live forever. In coming into this community, I have felt the warmth of people who love each other. Every time I talk to someone, they say, you will love it here. There is a commitment here to community in the many ways that people here are connected. From the people on the Capital Campaign Committee, to those stewards who showed up for training, to the way a large group of volunteers have already signed up to teach RE, and to the many others who populate the different committees here and keep things running. Because any vision of the future always begins in the present. Douglas Rushkoff gave the billionaire hedge fund managers a little advice after they had exhausted their shock collar speculations about the future. He said, I told them that their best bet would be to treat those people really well right now. They should be engaging with their security staffs as if they were members of their own family. And the more they could expand this ethos of inclusivity to the rest of their business practices, supply chain management, sustainability efforts, and wealth distribution, the less chance an event would actually happen. And he said they didn't buy it. Despite all their power and wealth, they could not even think that they could affect the future. The best they hoped for was a seat on a rocket to Mars. I find that incredibly sad. But despite their pessimism, I think that creating beloved community right here and now is a better bet than a rocket to Mars. 
And I think many of us are lucky enough to belong communities in which that vision is possible. We're voting today on a tangible way for us to hold that beloved community both now and in the future. So that in 10 years and 20 years, when another intern comes here, they will hear, as I did, you are going to love it here. Amen and blessed be.